gas training. My name's Alan Hart and today I'm at Viva Training Academy and I'm with Roy and Roy's an ex baxi trainer and Roy's going to go through the Baxi heat only boiler. He's going to strip it down and he's also going to go through some of the fault codes just to help you understand the Baxi heat only boiler a little bit better. So yeah, let's go over to, let's go over to Roy. This video is for gas safe registered and trainee gas engineers under supervision. Please comply with the current regulations at the time. Hi guys, it's Roy Fugel here at the Viva Training Academy over in Halifax. And today we're going to have a look at a heat only boiler. Um, we've done videos on combis. A heat only is a more compact boiler. The hot water is heated via a cylinder typically fitted to S and Y plans, that type of thing. This particular model is a Baxi main Eco. It's an early version of Baxi's heat only boilers, but it's the same internally as the Baxi 800, the Baxi 600, the Baxi Eco Blue, the Potterton Assure and the main Eco compact heat range. So anything we go through on this one, it's exactly the same on those boilers. So without further ado, I'll take the front off. So to remove the front on this particular model, there are two screws which are captive. So all that means is we just slacken them off. If I just pop underneath, just slacken them down. They won't come out, we'll just slacken them down. And then the one on the right hand side, once we get that down, this front just pops off. So there's two little catches underneath and we just ease that off, up and away. This front is made out of thermoplastic. It's about lightness, it's also insulated internally with polystyrene to keep the heat in the boiler. So that's the, uh, the front, dead simple to remove. So I'm just gonna pop that down over here. So the next thing we're gonna take out is the air inlet tube. So basically the air is drawn in through the air inlet down into this tube. That just uh, unhooks off the gas valve. There's a little uh, hook which goes over the top of the inlet port so we just release that and then slide it out just to the side so that's come out inside there's a little baffle plate what that's in there for is to stop any debris getting drawn into the fan it's also to help make the boiler quiet it's a silencer in effect and that's what all these little bumps and lumps are it's been designed to make boilers quiet we want them nice and quiet now compared to the older boilers that we used to have so again pop that to the side the next thing I'm going to remove is the flue tube. This is a downward firing burner. So basically the gas is fired down through the heat exchanger and then the flue products come back up this tube and up and away out of the flue. So it's just a case of releasing this little clip, lift that up, ease it off. There's a rubber seal in there and then there's a seal on the bottom. So again, that's the flue tube. So we've popped that out of the way. So looking inside there, it's not very busy. This is using what's called an air gas module. So we'll come on to that. So to access that, there's a little cable. This is a little cable that goes down to the control unit. It's low voltage. This is a little tip. The first of the tips that I'm gonna pass on to you. If we unclip that first, and it's just a little matter of pushing it in and undoing it, it's a little bit like an ethernet cable on your uh, computer system. You've got a little plastic catch that you push in and drop down. Then we've got a little catch on the top as we push that down, ease the front down. Because we've removed that cable, it allows this front to drop right the way down so we've got access. Obviously before I've started, I've isolated the boiler, I've uh, drained it all down. This one being in the workshop, it's purely a dry boiler. But before you start any work, obviously do all your safety checks. Safe isolation is paramount. We don't want to be putting our hands into circuit boards if it's still alive. So we make sure it's off. Safety gloves on, obviously. Um, there's nothing in here that's going to cut me, but to protect my delicate hands now. So we've got a couple of plugs that we're going to remove. The one on the bottom there is the connection plug for the sensors and things like that. So we just ease that down, just grab, grab the plug, pull that down, move it to the side. The one on the top right hand side is the mains connection. So that's just to the right hand side of the little, in, little involved fuse. So we'll pop that down. The next thing is the earth off the spark lead. So we'll pop that off. And then we've got the spark lead itself. 
So they're the only connections on this particular model. Now, what we'll do, we'll zoom in onto this circuit board short, shortly, and what you may notice is there are other connections on that board. This particular circuit board is used throughout the Baxi range on other products. Over in Holland, it's used on the Remea uh, brand of boilers, and they have combis based on this boiler. So that's why you'll see connections for things like pumps and diverter motors. But in the UK, it's a heat only boiler, so we don't have a pump built in. We don't have diverter valves and things like that. So we'll just close that front up. And then what we need to do is undo the gas connection. So we've turned the gas off underneath, or we would do if, if it was in the real world. This one's not piped up. So for those that are eagle-eyed, you may have noticed that this gas valve is quite familiar. It's an SIT gas valve. It's used throughout the industry. Baxi use it in various versions. Worcester use it and other boiler manufacturers. So it's quite a common um, gas valve. So to remove the old air gas unit now, there are two clips up at the top. So all we do, just flick the clip, you can hear it pop out. The same at that side, and then what we do, we just grab the little latches either side, and I'll try to do it from the side so you can see what I'm doing. Now what we have to do is lift the module up, and there's a little peg, which is part of the aluminium heat exchanger. The reason that's there is so when we, it, we don't drag it forward, we have to lift it, because what we want to do is lift it off the seal, the burner seal. If we dragged it, we may damage that seal. So we're just going to lift it up, ease it across, and then as we pop it out this right hand side, we've now got the air gas unit completely out. Right, so we've got the air gas unit. So obviously we've got the fan there, with the air inlet and then it's drawing the gas in through the gas valve into there mixing the air and gas in the fan up through down onto the uh, onto the burner which we'll have a look at shortly so if we turn this round and i just drop the front down so you can see now we've got the pcb the main circuit board in there a nice little feature on this uh, cover there's a little clip which has got a spare fuse in it's a 1.6 uh, amp fuse and that's the gas valve, the SIT848 gas valve that uh, we just talked about earlier, which is used in quite a lot of other appliances. So that's the air gas valve. It comes as a complete unit. Everything's in there, the fan, the gas valve, and the PCB. So we'll pop that to one side, and then we'll uh, carry on. So the next thing we're gonna take out is the burner. Now, there's a little uh, rubber flap, which is part of the burner seal just on the, uh, the side here, the left hand side. So we just lift that up and ease that burner out. So this is a mesh burner. So very easy to clean, just give it a brush over. You can actually rinse them out if they get really mucked up, but to be quite honest, in my experience, they don't get very dirty. This rubber seal, it's elastomeric silicon rubber, which means it's very flexible and it's only changed when necessary. It's not like some manufacturers where if you break the seal, you've got to replace it. This particular one, it can last a number of years. So it's just a case of having a good look at it and make sure that it's not showing any signs of any damage. So that's the burner. This particular uh, heat only boiler has got two thermistors, one on the floor, one on the return. Some heat only boilers may only have a floor thermistor. Uh, so these thermistors, the colour coded, the return is on blue and black wires and the floor is on red and black wires. They're in dry pockets, so it's just a case of unclipping the little clips and then they've got little ledges. So I'll, I'll just take the return one out so you can see it. I'll pop this out and it's just like a little thumb clip. So as we remove that, when you're holding it, it's nice and easy to get hold of without a tool. But if it is tight, what you can do, get your trusty uh, adjustable spanner and just pop it across there so you're not damaging it. And it'll just give you a little bit more leverage if you need to remove that. Now on this particular one, we've got an overheat stat up there. The overheat stat's there to protect the heat exchange if the boiler starts to overheat. Now this, this one, it's linked in series with a little clip up at the top. Now, on the larger output boilers, they have an air pressure switch. The air pressure switch isn't on there to prove that the fan is running. The air pressure switch is to prove that basically the heat exchanger isn't blocked. 
There was a British standard came in a few years ago, uh, BSEN 15502, and basically it was a manufacturing standard, so it's what boilers have got to be manufactured to, and it said, if the flue became blocked, what can happen to those flue products? Obviously with condensing boilers, the condensate pipe becomes a second flue, and the idea is if it blocks up, the flue um, products can't get away, so before they start going down the condensate path, they would trip that. The reason that this boiler doesn't have one is that quite simply, uh, the output on it is not as enough. The fan can't run fast enough to blow the condensate out through the condensate trap. But the larger output models, the fan runs faster. So some of the boilers that you may have been worked on, you've noticed the air pressure switches start being put onto those. So that's the reason for that. So that's just got a little clip on there. Uh, just another couple of things that are, that are on here. Now, there's a wire that doesn't clip onto anywhere, doesn't go anywhere. I mentioned earlier that over in Holland, they have a combi version of this. Now that's for the hot water flow sensor on the combi, on the hydraulic block. The UK version doesn't have it. There's a little thing down here. I'll just unclip it so you can see it. Now, this little thing pops out. And this is called the PSU, the primary storage unit. This links in with the main circuit board and actually identifies the boiler as what model it is, what output it is. So it helps with information onto the main circuit board about fan speeds and things which obviously affect the amount of gas that it's burning. So that's the PSU. The only other thing on here um, that we've not talked about is the auto air vent. Up at the top there's an auto air vent. So basically, when we're filling the system up, after we've installed it, we get air trapped in there so it clears the air out. And we've got a nice little proper drain cock, a brass, old fashioned half inch drain cock on there. One of the problems when we have to drain boilers down, sometimes the drain points aren't very accessible, they're not very easy to get onto, but this is a good old fashioned half inch drain cock. So that's a little bit about the boiler. What I'm going to do is put it back together and then we'll talk about the indicator lights. Right, so we've now got it all back together. Um, even though this boiler's a dry boiler, we can still plug it in, it's still live. I've done my electrical safety checks to make sure it's safe for me to plug in. So I'm just going to go through the indicator lights on here. Some boilers will have a display screen so you'll have more information. This particular boiler, um, has only got a switch live, a neutral and an earth. It doesn't need a pump overrun. Uh, some heat only boilers need a pump overrun. What a pump overrun is, is basically something that carries on the pump running after the heating demand has ceased to cool the boiler down. Because this has got a large aluminium heat exchanger, that can dissipate the heat in there without the need for a pump overrun. So, to have a display, we would need a permanent live. This one doesn't have it, it's just got a switch live. So I'm just gonna turn the power on. And what you'll notice is the lights come on. There's two little green lights on at the moment. One says reset above it, and one's got the universal symbol for chimney sweep, which is the little ladder and the top hat. Some manufacturers call it chimney sweep function, some manufacturers call it flu sweep, service mode. There's all sorts of different title sorry but it's a way of getting that boiler to go into high fire or low fire when we're doing our commissioning and things like that so the little green light above the reset it doesn't mean that there's a reset what it actually means is we've got a, a demand for heat on this boiler so if we then turn up the thermostat on there what will happen or should happen the boiler's going to try fire and we'll get the other little indicator light would start to flash obviously this boiler is not going to fire up because it's not connected so what this is going to simulate is it's not lighting so what we'll start to get is the little light coming on there and what we should find is it's a green light that comes on so it's going to go try to go through an ignition cycle and because it doesn't light because there's no gas going to it it's going to give us an indication Now this particular boiler goes through a number of cycles 
Some manufacturers, it's three ignition cycles before it fails. Others, it could be four. Some are five, some are six, some are seven. That's where you really need to get hold of the manufacturer's instructions. In there, it will indicate how many attempts it has before it fails. Once it fails, we're going to get some red lights coming on there. So it needs to go through that cycle. So we've now got the red light on there and it's flashing one, two, three times. So it's in it's three lights flashing. Obviously, you know that that's an ignition failure because that's what I've just told you. If you weren't familiar with this boiler, you'd find that information a number of places. Manufacturers instructions. Baxi, along with a lot of other manufacturers now, they have apps and it's on the app. Engineer manuals, it's also in there. So what we're going to do now, we'll have a refer to the engineer manual and I'll show you where we're going to find that information. Right, so I've now got the engineer manual and I'm on the page that says HMI, Human Machine Interface. That's what some manufacturers call the controls. So as we can see, we've got some charts with green lights on, red lights and amber lights. The red lights are what I'm interested in. They're the ones that are showing me the fault codes. And as we can see, we've got three red light flashes and that's indicating an ignition fault. So I need to reset that. So the good thing about this particular boiler is a lot of manufacturers, when you come to reset them, they've reset buttons or they've reset knobs. Do you push the button for three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, five minutes? It varies. And unless you know, you may push the reset button. If you don't push it for long enough or hold the knob for long enough, it doesn't reset. And then if you're not totally familiar with that appliance, you might think, oh, it's not resetting, it's got a different fault. It just wants an extra little bit. The good thing about this one is that when we push that reset button and hold it in, after a few seconds, it starts to flash rapidly on the red light. So that's saying, yes, I know you want to reset me. I'm gonna go through a reset. So that's really good on this particular boiler. So the next thing I'm gonna do is just turn that off. We don't need the boiler on to show this one. And I'm just gonna show you another error code and we'll have a look at that. So in this instance, I'm just gonna slide off that air tube and unclip the return sensor. So I've just undone the return sensor, just unclip that. So now the red light's flashing again, but this time it's only flashing once. So we're gonna have a look at the manual and then we'll come back to that. So again, I've got the, uh, the engineer manual and as we can see, one flash is saying it's that sensor error. So again, I've just pushed the reset button and as soon as the little red light starts to flash, I know that it know it's gonna reset there. So I'm quite happy. If it didn't reset, that's gonna be because that thermistor has failed. I'm gonna to need to replace the thermistor or test the thermistor before I replace it. So if I plug that thermistor back in, because I know it's a good thermistor, and then we reset it again, this time it should reset. So we've now got the little green lights popped back on, so it has reset. So hopefully you've enjoyed the video that we've done today, stripping the boiler down, going through some of the error codes. Um, I've been Roy Fugler at Viva Training Academy. Until next time, thanks very much. See you later. Thank you once again for that, Roy. And again, thank you to Viva Training Academy, who's putting a lot of time and effort into helping you guys, helping the people that watch this YouTube channel. Um, so thank you very much to them. If you do have any questions for Roy or for Viva Training Academy, if you've got any questions to do with um, boilers etc all that you'd like us to cover then please put a comment below and yeah thanks for watching